Hey folks, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, please remember you can thumb up the video, you can subscribe to the channel or the Patreon, but most of all, get your comments down below about this game or any of the others from this publisher's range. We'll get on in just a second, but first, a quick word from the sponsor. As a fellow gamer, you'll understand this is unacceptable. The solution? Head down to my new sponsor, kiender.co.uk. Kiender stocks many of the hot new releases as well as some old hidden gems. Free delivery on orders over £30, further discounts on bulk purchases, and even 5% of your spending refunded back to you as points to be used for further discounts down the line. If you use the referral link in the description below and sign up for a new account, you'll get 5% discount on your first order over £60. So let's make gaps in your collection a thing of the past. Get down to Kiender and start saving today. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the video. Get on with it. So today we're taking a look at one of Board and Dice's two new releases that are kind of the hit list for Essen and Yangon. This one being Terracotta Army and thanks to uh, Board and Dice for supplying me with a review copy as well. So this is not a game in their usual T series of games. I mean, yes, it is called Terracotta Army, but it's not like, you know, Tekenu or Teotihuacan or anything like that. You know, they are very separate from how this feels. This is like different designers. It's different feel, different look. It's definitely not, I think, to be confused with those games. It's one in its own right. It just happens to begin with T, I suppose. So in Terracotta Army, you have an action wheel here and workers that you will place around the outside of the board. I'm going to have to make certain I get a few of the uh, bits and bobs from underneath the board here. But essentially you have these tiny little workers, you'll pop them around the outside and resolve three actions on the wheel. But you can spend money to twist the wheel slightly to change what they do. They could give you money which is used to get master abilities, it could give you clay which is used to build the warriors, and it could give you some other little bonuses as well. But what you are doing primarily is that you are trying to build statues on this grid here. So you've got specialist statues in grey that score or do various different effects. But then you also have these generic four warriors here, each with their own associated weapon token that you can build in order to place on the grid wherever you want. You'll have bases on the various warriors to dictate they are yours. And what you're essentially doing is you're building them for victory points generally but then there's end of round objective scoring and there's end game scoring based on who's got the most of them within particular groups a group of the same type of warrior next to each other orthogonally but each round you've also got two inspector pawns that go around the outside of this uh, little grid that score the row and column based on who's got the most essentially it all revolves around two words domination and presence domination you've got the most of something presence you have at least one of something and so each round you will basically get your workers back you'll you'll plonk them on this wheel more and more you'll keep getting money and clay and spending and these warriors will dwindle in value but this board will get much more congregated with a lot of warriors on it and specialists more on that later and so you keep going until five rounds are done at which point you then score the groups based on a selected criteria and then of course the one with the most points of course so that's a very basic overview of the game because there's a bit too much to go into too much detail there so first off let's talk about the components and the production quality hit and miss and board and dice do have a thing about this you almost feel that the b in board and dice almost stands for budget at times now you do get miniatures here you get a decent organizer box with these statues in it but there's not a ton of detail on them and they are basically bendy plastic so expect a few floppy spears every now and again I feel like I'm gonna break this damn thing. They're fine. They do the job even though the color coding could be better. I mean, you have you know, cream and then you have gray and then you have light brown and dark brown and then all the specialists are gray, which is fine when it's a horse and you can easily tell it apart, but then it's a bit harder when it's a musician or a footman, which yes, they have the bases of different shape, but when you are littering this thing with a ton of warriors, Good luck trying to spot that when you have a cacophony of warriors all over the place. It gets very crowded very quickly. The other components are pretty basic as well. I mean, the coins, I hate these coins. I get the idea you want to be authentic, but for a game that literally has no theme whatsoever, I mean, when you are playing this game, the whole thing about it being the Terracotta Army is pretty much non-existent, so don't worry about that. The fact that you then go, right, well, we've got to have at least Chinese currency in here with these annoying little bits in the middle that you've got to pop out with a chopstick or something because your fingers are too fat and you've got to do this to about 100 coins. No, I'm not punching these out. 
This is stupid. I'm using iron clay chips. I hate these coins. I get that they are, they're authentic Chinese currency, but is there not a better way of doing this? The clay tokens are also literally just a cardboard tile where you've got cracked clay and then just solid brown with barely a texture on it. It's very basic looking clay. I mean, you couldn't even just give us wooden bricks or something like in Catan or any other game that does this. Really, the only bit you're spending that much money on is the action wheel, and even then, it's just basically two dials that you just pop into the board and they twist around just fine. Although, the annoying thing with this is that as you spin one, it always spins the one above or below it. So, I want to turn this one. Oop, turns the whole thing. So, okay, I've got to hold this in place, spin that, and then because it goes the opposite way around, I've then got to hold this one in place while moving that one, it's fiddly and kind of annoying. Now for ease of play, this is mainly a mid-weight game, but I feel that this tries to go out of its way to make life more fiddly for you than it should be. You know, the rule book is not a small rule book. I mean, there's quite a lot of pages in here. 24, 20, yeah, 24 odd pages in here. There's quite a bit going on. But I will give credit to some of this rule book. The actual rules themselves, if you have played these types of games before, are not very complicated. There's a lot of pictorial examples. There's a lot of like, you know, sidebar, like side boxes with key parts in them. There's, you know, a chart with all the different iconography on it and such. So there certainly is a lot of good stuff to say about this rule book. It's not always worded great. I mean, the kneeling archer rules, the specialist for the archer and the end game scoring, takes a couple of read-throughs to really understand, but for the most part, a lot of these rules are not too hard to understand. And, you know, even the end-game scoring has a decent amount of pictorial you know, representation examples to get the point across. Where this rulebook falters quite badly, however, is the lack of any decent reference aids. You have got, at the back of the book, you know, a couple of reference pages, which is nice, for the warriors and the various master abilities. Great except they're in the back of the rule book. Where's my reference card for each player? I don't want to have to pass a book round every time somebody wants to look up a particular thing. And even then, that tells you the abilities. Okay, cool, because the iconography in this game is far from intuitive. It's actually pretty distracting at times, but you know, this will explain it fine. But then all you have for a reference aid is this on the back of the rule book. And frankly, it sucks. <laughs> It sucks as a reference aid. It tells you five of the abilities in a nice little chart here, but then it foregoes the chart to tell you about other bits, which doesn't make sense. Why don't you just make one big chart and put them all in there? But then also, when it gets to the point about building a specialist or masters or warriors, it tells you, see page 15 for details. The detail information can be found on pages 15 and 16. I don't want a reference guide to tell me where in the book I can find the detailed rules. Give me a summary sheet for each player with the rules for everything on it. And especially for scoring, because the scoring in this game is barely noticeable on anything. You've got a symbol for victory points, which doesn't even tell you that's the symbol for victory points anywhere in the book. But you know what you're scoring for these warriors, but then the specialists? If you were to literally just look at the iconography down here, you might struggle to understand exactly what it's going on about just from here. And that's just like when you place them down. It doesn't specify what's end game scoring. You have to figure that out from the iconography. But then the various things that you do in the interim scoring, it, you have to go into the book to find it. And end game scoring is a wall of text, which you have to read like very carefully to make certain you don't make a mistake. But none of that is on the board. So there's no like, you know, turn structure part on this board. You've got little bits like little reminders, but they're kind of dotted around randomly so you can easily miss them when you're trying to do stuff. And that is a problem because, uh, you know, I like to give praise to a decent rule book and a lot of this rule book is decent, but why no reference guide? Is it really, that? I mean, you've got miniatures everywhere. You know, you always put a ton of dice in your games. Can you not give each player a reference aid? In 2022, we should not be skimping like this on games. Each player deserves a rules reference guide in every game there is full stop. Everybody got that? There should be no exceptions unless the game is literally no thanks or can't stop. But in a game like this, which has a lot of rules and multiple ways to score points, I want 
a reference guide. Now the whole game essentially revolves around the manipulation of which warriors you build at what time and where they go on the grid while juggling around this action wheel. The actions on this wheel though kind of rinse repeat themselves a lot so as much as it is cool to kind of manipulate the wheel to how you see fit that kind of gets a little bit samey relatively quickly. The master abilities are quite a cool thing you essentially have a token that you place on a master to say you have like you know affiliation with them and it gets more expensive as the game goes on to like you know the more masters you have the more pricey it gets but these masters are not balanced no way I mean there is a master here that allows you to place a warrior using as much money as the number of rounds you're on. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. That quickly gets very expensive because money is not something you have in abundance in this game. You can pay money to move this wheel around, which you're gonna need to a lot. You need money for specialists. You need money to get the master ability in the first place. Money is not something you have a ton of. So to be able to use this ability in later rounds just doesn't happen. You know, I, I, every time I've seen people use it, they use it maybe once, twice if they're lucky, and then never again for the rest of the game. Whoopee. Honestly, being able to flip all your weapon tokens over is pretty good, considering that the weapon abilities on these warriors is something that you cannot ignore. They get you points, they let you get more money, they let you manipulate these inspector pawns. The weapons are critical to what you're doing, and not to mention you need a ready weapon to get the specialist on the board in the first place. That master is one to go for. But then you've got the warehouses around the wheel to get clay from. A pretty decent source of clay as long as you take the action to wetten them later. And yeah, more on that in a second. Uh, the one that just gives you a bunch of clay each time you use them. That's pretty powerful in itself. So yeah, these masters are great, but I find myself going for the same two or three every single game and not really going for any of the others because the others are much more situational, whereas these ones like flipping your weapon tokens and getting more clay are just universally good. Now, notice the way I said wet in clay. Um, I mentioned that the theme of this game is non-existent, and I stand by that. The theme in this is just gone. I mean, as soon as I mention what the game's about, I can just tell people to forget the theme. But what this game does is basically it's an excuse for children to generate as many wet jokes as possible because you have to wet your clay in order to use it to make warriors. The amount of jokes that come through every game I play about making things wet or moist is limitless. Yes, sir! <laughs> you know, we spent most of the time laughing in this game because of the jokes we were making about the clay, because we couldn't say the words together without sniggering. <laughs> I had to be careful that I wasn't riding the high of this game purely because of us being children and joking around, as opposed to like the game actually being fun to play. The whole puzzle with the warriors is good. I like the idea that you can move some of these around with one of the warrior abilities. I like the way that you have to juggle which weapons you've got available at what time. I like the way that, you know, with the musicians and the horse, for example, you've got various, like, cool little tactics you can play in order to get dominance and presence in an area. But you don't do a lot of interaction with the opponents, and this area becomes such a crowded affair that, like I said, it just makes scoring a chore trying to figure out who's got what and where. You're constantly looking into it with your eyes getting sore, just trying to pick out which ones are yours because the bases, yes, they're color coded, but when you've got all of these on this board here, it's chaos. It's a ton of stuff to look at and try and decipher and it gets a little bit hard to visualize really effectively. The other thing is that the scoring just seemed a little bit lackluster in a lot of areas. I mean, getting points for these is great. The whole dominance and presence thing though, I mean, some of these objectives each round is literally have the most clay. Well, to get presence, you need to have one clay. It's not difficult to have a single clay in your area for a bunch of points, but you could make so much effort trying to get domination, and yet that only scores you a few extra points more. It's far more effective just to have presence in a bunch of different pots than it is to win domination on a couple of pots and nothing in the others. So it didn't feel like the point scoring really changed that much based on who had domination and presence anywhere. And of course, when you are scoring points for stuff, like you might get three points for this and whatever, considering in most games you tend to lap the board, I don't think it's really that tricky. In fact, I think I, I think I remember lapping the board twice in some of the games, like getting 200 and something points. When you've got 200 plus points, the whole idea of getting six, seven here and there, 
doesn't equate to a ton when you all think about it. It's very difficult to necessarily see who's going to take the victory at the very end because of the end game scoring, and so it just feels a little bit anticlimactic. The duration of the game on the box is 90 to 120 minutes. I'd say that's closer to being 90 to 180 because it depends entirely on the players. Because this game has a very bad player scaling issue. With two, three or four players you can play this with, the solo mode we'll touch on briefly later, but for two players, the game goes at a reasonable pace and you should be able to get it done in 90 minutes. The problem with two players though is that the whole tug of war thing with this board here where you're vying for control and you know positioning your warriors for the inspector pawns and stuff like that, uh, that kind of doesn't feel quite as fulfilling in a two player game because it's just basically you and the opponent, there's not a huge amount of player interaction in this game and so you're just kind of like doing a tug of war with one other person. Three players I find tends to be the sweet spot because with four players, hooey! Um, this board here gets littered with so many warriors in that that you end up in a situation where you can barely see what's going on in terms of who owns what and what should score what. The musicians in particular, they're on their knees, so they're low down and they don't have a color base, they're not different colors of the specialists, and you will not be able to tell it has a cross base because it's surrounded by a bunch of other miniatures. Unless you are looking top down on this thing, you're gonna look at it from a distance and you're gonna not see where the musicians are very easily. And so what happens is that the game screeches constantly on its breaks when it's scoring time. You know, each and every round, you've then got to go, right, hang on, so we're scoring this objective. Who's got presence and domination? Right, we've got that one sorted. Okay, musicians. Oh, God, there's like three of them on there. All right, so hang on, where's the uh, musician? Right, that's got one, two, three, oh, four for me there. Right, and there's one, two, oh, but you're facing two musicians, so there's another two for yellow, okay. And it's just constantly, er, er, er. You get into the flow of a round and then the round ends and then you're having to stop the game dead to do scoring. It's a bit like the problem with Bunny Kingdom. It had a similar deal. You play a really cool round and then the game screeches to a halt to do the interim scoring and this is no exception. And the you know, least said about the end game scoring, the better. I mean, you'll spend pretty much a round's worth of time just trying to do the end game scoring for as you're trying to understand what makes a group and how to do what scores for what and counting how many different players are in a group for each points worth for each warrior. It's like, argh, gets very, very fiddly at times. But the other problem with four players, analysis paralysis. This wheel I like. <clears throat> I think it's a cool idea, the idea that you've got this wheel that you can manipulate to a little bit of an extent and you choose your particular segment and you put your worker there and you get all the actions. Here's the problem. This is basically an analysis paralysis generating machine. It's insanity, especially in four players because <clears throat> you already have a ton of spaces to do. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 12 different spaces here, so that's 12. But you can pay two coins to move this wheel of space or that wheel of space. So your 12 spaces just became umpteen amount of different combinations with this wheel, which is cool from a gameplay perspective, but this causes players to freeze up like crazy because there are too many options to consider. And each one that involves building warriors and that has four different types of warriors to build each with a weapon token that you could flip. And then depending where you place it, might incur some other effect or some other consideration. But then that's just when you know that everything's available to you. If you're going third or fourth in the turn order in a four player game, good luck trying to get what you want to do because every as soon as somebody nicks your space or worse, twists the wheel slightly, suddenly your plan A is dead. So, so could plan B and C. You need to have about three or four different plans for your turn because it's very easy for a player to literally just do something that benefits them, not realizing that it screws you over in the process and now you've got to rethink pretty much your entire turn. It's a nightmare in four players. In fact, without reference guides and without you know these things to make the game a bit smoother, I don't know if I really want to play this with four players ever again. I think I'm going to cap this at three for, for life. I don't want to play this with four with that much analysis paralysis and that much chaos on this board. Two just feels a little bit too loosey-goosey. Three just seems to be a bit of a sweet spot. I find that's my perfect player count for this game, but then do I want a game where I only have really one player count? Here's the rule book for the main game. Cool. 
Where's the robot with the solo mode? Oh yes, it's online. You gotta go download it as a PDF from the website. I hate it when rules are stuck online. I know we're in a digital age, people, but for crying out loud, give me a book to read. They're easier to pull out for reference purposes and they're easier to learn from. I hate staring at a phone screen for ages, reading a rule book to try and understand what's going on, okay? Hate it, don't like it. But that being said, the solo mode itself, it's a David Turksy design, so it is pretty good and pretty solid. It's a 10 page rule book though, and the main issue with it is not its gameplay. The gameplay of it is actually pretty decent. In fact, I dare say it's probably better playing the solo than it is two player. In fact, honestly, I'd probably say it's better playing the solo than it is multiplayer. The solo mode pits you up against an AI opponent and, you know, does a good job of giving you a nice puzzle to figure out. The problem with the solo mode though is that, much like a lot of these other designs, it's a little complicated in places. To start with, the main sort of turn sequence is not tricky, but then you have a different priority rule for what the AI will do based on numbers on a grid. I mean, there's literally a diagram with numbers for this grid that you're supposed to follow differently in each round. That gets fiddly. You've then got, you know, what warrior will it build each turn? What, what it does with the specialists, etc. That gets fiddly. They have spare actions as opposed to like, you know, master actions. It is basically a whole new game that you are learning on top of the game already to learn the solo play. So it's a bit of a slog, but it is a decent, like a wordy result once you get to the end of that slog. Problem is, put this game away and don't play it for a few weeks, you're gonna forget all those rules and you're gonna have to learn them over again. <laughs> that is not something I can see myself doing very easily. But that being said, it's still a decent solo mode. I just wish that the rule book was actually in the box and it was just a little bit more streamlined, but it is a pretty solid game to play in that mode. So Terracotta Army is fine, it's okay, but sadly it's not one that's gonna blow my mind. It's not one that's suddenly gonna rejuvenate the board and dice line because I started off pretty highly with the T series and then they started dropping off as time went on. This one is, Okay, I mean, people I've played it with have enjoyed it, but none of them have come away saying that this is like, oh, a must buy, or oh, I'm gonna like really, really love this one. They've come away saying, I like it, it's good, but they won't necessarily seek it out. They're not gonna ask me to bring it back to the table again. They'll just be like, yeah, cool, I'll play it if you bring it to the table again. But with four players, I don't know if I ever wanna teach this to three new players ever again because of it. So chances are I'm only gonna restrict it to three because I won't get two player games at the table very often. That becomes a problem for me. And so you've got the solo mode, but then if I put this away on the shelf, I'm gonna forget those solo rules because of all the priorities and all the different rules for each warrior and specialist I've got to learn, which becomes a bit of a chore. So for me, this game doesn't really have a place to, re you know, doesn't replace any other midweight euro I've got. And it's not bringing anything that new to the table other than just the idea of, you know, area control with these uh, statues to make it stand out from the crowd. It feels like another euro game with a mechanic that's fine, with some puzzly aspects, but just some annoying things that make the game a bit more fiddly and a bit more long than it should be. If we could shave 30 minutes off the length of this game and make it a little bit smoother with maybe less scoring all the time, I reckon this would be a solid, solid hit. But as it stands, for me, this one scores a respectable and comfortable 6 out of 10. Not quite high enough for me to go giving my seal of endorsement to it, but I can see this one is going to have its fans. There are some people who really love this. I think they're being very forgiving of some of the uh, ease of play aspects, but to each their own. You know, so it's for me, it's a fine game. I would play it, but it's not one I'm going to seek out. It's not one that I'm going to say everybody must go out and grab. I think Board and Dice have done better Euro games today. I think I'd still rather play Tekenu. I'd much rather play Teo Tehuacan. And certainly the newest one, Tiletum, which I've got to review in the other room, looks a little bit more interesting as well. But like I say, to each their own. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So by all means, get your comments down below and let me know your thoughts on this, on anything in the game. Have you played it? Is it a hit for you? Was it a dud for you? Let's hear what you have to say. 
So that's it for me. Remember, you can always thumb up the video, subscribe to the channel or the Patreon, but most of all, get your comments down below and let me know your thoughts on Terracotta Army. Is it a hit for you? Is it a dud for you? What do you think of the other T-series of board and dice? You know, are you looking forward to Taltum? Get your thoughts down below. I want to hear, and I'm sure other people do as well. Until next time, you can check out more content on the channel, including the Top 100, which is entering the second half of the list finally, but also some cool reviews that I've been doing in preparation for Essen with some new releases expected there. Take care and remember as always, regardless of how you're going to arrange these statues in this giant grid here, it's still only a game. Take care, bye for now.